something in close before uh, a radar signature gets transmitted back to the enemy. Because even when the door is open, now suddenly you have sharp corners and weird angles, and that can reflect radar back in the, the, a direction you don't want to. The Air Force plans to eventually purchase 339 Raptors, and production of the aircraft is scheduled to continue to 2013. The F-A-22 is an Air Force pilot's dream. But there are planes on the horizon that may be more like a pilot's nightmare, because these aircraft have no pilots. The F-15 Eagle can climb at more than 40,000 feet per minute. That's sea level to the top of Mount Everest in 45 seconds. Extreme aircraft will return on Modern Marvels. The Global Hawk spy plane points the way to what some believe will be a pilotless future. This UAV, or unmanned air vehicle, was seen in action by millions thanks to TV news coverage of its surveillance missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. The Global Hawk can conduct effective surveillance over an area the size of Illinois in just 24 hours. It can also loiter above a specific area, transmitting almost real-time high-resolution images to field commanders. 44 feet long and 15 feet high, the high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft was built for the Air Force by Northrop Grumman. Global Hawk is an autonomous air vehicle. Uh, for instance, uh, when Global Hawk uh, did a deployment to Australia, the Global Hawk left California with a click of the mouse. Uh, it is fully autonomous, and then it uh, flew across the Pacific Ocean and landed in Australia some 20-odd hours later, uh, at which time somebody clicked the mouse again and shut the engine down on the system. With its range of more than 14,000 miles and an ability to fly for 36 hours straight, it can travel to any point on the globe, conduct surveillance, and return to its base in the United States, all without a pilot. The Air Force rushed the Global Hawk into combat ahead of schedule in Afghanistan in November of 2001, and it was also used in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Although it flew only 5% of the surveillance missions over Iraq, it accounted for more than 55% of the information on time-sensitive targets, many of which were destroyed. After collecting more than 3,700 images over Iraq, the Hawk returned home in May of 2003. Air Force officials said the Global Hawk was over Iraq from the very beginning of the operation and had a direct impact on the Republican Guard's destruction. Although most use of UAVs so far has been for reconnaissance, there is growing interest in putting weapons on them. The Unmanned Combat Air Vehicle, or UCAV, is seen by some as the top gun of the future. One of the most dramatic first uses of an armed unmanned aircraft in combat came during Operation Iraqi Freedom, when Predator reconnaissance drones were outfitted with Hellfire missiles. There's one famous mission that the Air Force likes to talk about during Iraqi Freedom. There was a broadcast tower from the Iraqi Information Agency in downtown Baghdad, and that tower was very close, I believe, to the Fox News Tower and also to a mosque. And so it was a very, very dangerous target for the Air Force to go after. So what it did was it sent a, a Predator unmanned aircraft armed with Hellfire missiles into downtown Baghdad. And the remote pilot who was operating the aircraft from thousands of miles away in the ground control station was able to pinpoint that tower and actually take it out without any collateral damage to the Fox Tower or to the mosque. The Air Force is now testing the Boeing X-45 UCAV demonstrator, which first flew in 2002. The X-45 is the first unmanned aircraft that has been designed from its inception to be a, a combat vehicle. 
Mark Impact. A larger version, the X-45C, is the precursor of Air Force UCAVs that will become operational in 2010. The X-45C will be nearly 40 feet long, with a wingspan of nearly 50 feet. It will be able to carry eight GPS-guided bombs, weighing 250 pounds each in its internal weapons bays. Northrop Grumman is also testing an unmanned combat air vehicle. The X-47A Pegasus. It was designed as a flight demonstrator for the X-47B that could be used by the Navy. Pegasus was our UCAV demonstrator. It was a company-funded investment. The way we approached the Pegasus was basically to demonstrate that, in fact, you could take an unmanned combat air vehicle and land it on the deck of an aircraft carrier. There is still some debate, even within the military, about how and when UCAV should be deployed. I think there's just this sort of rules of the game, ethical bridge to be crossed of is it okay for a drone to be, you know, f and firing and are we really sure that that's Osama and, you know, not the head of the orphanage who's walking along the street. There's a lot of, you know, queasiness about doing this because, you know, you're looking through a soda straw on these things and, you know, are you really sure that's the guy? The chances of making a mistake are, are pretty high and you really don't, obviously don't want to kill innocent people. We must be very, very careful that we don't develop systems that are so complex that they really transgress whether or not they should be inhabited systems. There's a tremendous value in having the inhabited system because, to be frank about it, an inhabited aircraft carries with it a great deal of, of innate common sense that sometimes you don't have in a system that's relying on the lineup of ones and zeros. It remains to be seen how commercial airline pilots and private pilots will feel about sharing airspace with planes that have no pilots. Years ago, if you, any one of us got into an elevator, there was an operator, uh, an attendant inside the elevator. Today, I, I certainly don't see that person in the elevator anymore. You get at many airports today, and you want to get to another terminal. You get on an unmanned train, and we accept that. It's normal. That's going to take place with UAVs, for sure. Uh, the technology is there, uh, the will is there, and it's now just a matter of time. As aircraft technology continues its flight into the future, exciting possibilities are opening up that could change our lives and bring the world closer together, just as the jet age did. The challenge for us today is to capitalize on some of these new technologies, and if we seize on that, we will indeed have, I think, a high-speed future. But if we do not, that future will be in the hands of other people.